Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and it is December 30th, 2015, and I've been away from the microphone for a little over a week now. been traveling. I was down in Brazil for the holidays, and I hope all the listeners had a happy and productive Christmas for themselves and with their families. And the subject of tonight's podcast is going to be guilt. What is the nature of guilt? How can it be limited? And how it can be eradicated? And I got the idea to do this podcast after watching down in in uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, the new film Macbeth starring Michael Fassbender. It's a very good, very good movie. And I'm not a huge Shakespeare fan, but I've got to give credit where it's due. This was a very, very good production. I think everyone should see it. And it got me thinking about guilt, the nature of guilt, its destructive powers and qualities, and its elusive and pervasive nature. It must be one of the most insidious and difficult to eradicate of all the vices. And for that reason, I wanted to make a podcast about it. I also wrote an article about it, which I published today, and I wanted to have a podcast to go to go along with it. And for the most part, I'm going to read my article in this podcast and add maybe some extra commentary here and there as needed. Because sometimes people like to receive their information in different ways. Some people like to read it, some like to download it and listen to it in a pensive moment, and that's fine. I encourage people to do that, and I hope they will do that. Before we get into the discussion of of guilt, I want to make it clear what we're talking about here. I'm not so much talking about criminal culpability or guilt as a legal matter, as a commenter on the article mentioned. I'm talking about guilt more as a product of our relations with others, with ourselves, with successes or failures we may have had in life. And it's more of an examination of guilt from a psychological dimension. And there's a difference. There's a difference. So I'll read what I wrote to this commenter here in response to him. I I told him, I said, I'm not speaking here of criminal culpability. I'm talking about psychological baggage foisted on us by family, friends, and society for other things like alleged failings in work, human relations, or life opportunities. So there's a difference. There's a difference here, and I want to make that clear before we get into our discussion of guilt. All right, let's start. I saw the new film Macbeth starting starring Michael Fassbender at the Botchfogo district of Rio de Janeiro a couple nights ago. I recommend it highly, as the production values are incredible and the pulse of the drama is intense. I don't consider myself a big Shakespeare fan. I like a few of the major plays, Hamlet, Macbeth, etc., but many of the others I find to be tedious. The event turned out to be an opportunity to reflect on the qualities and consequences of guilt. Readers may be familiar with the gist of the play. The usurper Macbeth murders a king at the instigation of his wife and then is forced to deal with the consequences of this terrible act. In a variety of ways, he becomes consumed by guilt and self-loathing. He hallucinates, ruminates, and gives himself over to ever-escalating incidents of brutality. The result is a trajectory of self-destruction from which there is no escape. But let us leave the story of Macbeth aside for the moment. As I said in this presentation, in this article, we're going to be talking about a different type of guilt. Guilt foisted on us by our imaginary and real transgressions. That would be of a non-criminal nature. One does not have to be enmeshed in such dramas to be affected by guilt or its consequences. I believe that guilt is one of the most insidious and difficult to eradicate of vices. 
Why is this? Why is this? These are some of the tentative conclusions I've drawn. Well, the first reason is that guilt can creep up on you no matter what the outcome of some event is. It can seize you regardless whether you were successful in some endeavor or whether you were unsuccessful in some endeavor. You can feel guilty about success, for example, and you can feel guilt about failure. Guilt gets you both coming and going. And unlike other vices, it seems to exist independently of the outcome of something. It is a sneaky, devious little vice, and you can never turn your back on it. The second reason guilt is so insidious is that it is very easy to transfer it from one person to another. It is a prime tool of the manipulator, a prime tool of the manipulator. Families and friends know this well, and they are often the prime vectors in the transmission of this disease. It has an ease of communicability, and it can spread very, very rapidly. Whole groups, whole families, and even whole nations can suffer from it collectively. Yes, I said disease. I said disease. I used that word, for there really is no other word for it. The third reason guilt is so insidious is that it is very difficult to purge oneself of. It is difficult to eradicate, just as tendrils of ivy torn out of a garden will seem to disappear for a year or a season or two, and then suddenly tendrils will again begin to form. Once it takes hold, like a a uh, parasitic plant entwined around a tree, uh, a tree it does not want to leave it has a psychological dimension that finds very fertile growing ground in the mind and no matter how hard you try to shake it off somehow it always leaves some form of residue some strains of ivy are very difficult to eradicate and when i say eradicate i mean that literally the word itself signifies a tearing up of the roots the word radix in Latin means just that, root. So all of this is demonstrated amply by our own experiences. We can all list them, we can all number them, we can all think of them. We've all been plagued by guilt at one point or, or another in our lives. You can recall the many instances where these things have played out in reality. So what then is to be done? How can we rid ourselves of this curse of guilt. And make no mistake, guilt does us no good. It weighs on the mind, draining our energies, and robs us of the proper enjoyment of life. It generates resentments, phobias, complexes, and neuroses. So it must be eradicated completely and totally if we are to advance. From my own experiences and observations, there seem to be only a few techniques that work. Despite what everyone says about this and breathing exercises and thinking about meditating about this or that. None of that works, at least in my opinion, it doesn't. Some people say you need to take, make a positive affirmation about yourself or you need to keep a journal or you need somehow magically to just let it drop like a pile of bricks. Would that this were true. None of that nonsense works. In fact, the truth is that there is no really good way to get rid of guilt except by totally reformatting your brain. You almost have to hit a control-alt-delete switch in your brain chemistry. Reformat the hard drive if you have to. So what's the first step? The first step is we must turn a mental switch on in our minds. We must believe in our very bones that certain negative feelings are derived from guilt. We have to Diagnose the affliction as guilt and be certain of it. So the first step is diagnosis. The first step is identification. That is, we must first identify that the source of our anger, malaise, or depression is guilt. It all proceeds from guilt. Now this sounds easier than it is. Because as I've said, guilt is expert at camouflaging itself as something else. It's an expert at that. It somehow latches on to our regular thought processes and rides along 
like some backseat driver. That's what you can think of guilt as. It's that obnoxious, annoying, destructive backseat driver of the mind that never leaves us alone. Now the second step is getting real to getting rid of guilt is this. It is firmly, decisively, and finally deciding not to allow it into our thoughts anymore. You have to tell yourself and mean it that you don't, that you didn't do anything wrong. And even if you did do something wrong, you have to tell yourself and mean it that you've served your sentence. Now when I say this, served your sentence, I'm not speaking literally as a criminal matter of culpability. I mean a sentence of um, a sentence of moral suffering, let's call it that. A sentence of self-imposed purgatory that we put ourselves in when we are tormented by guilt over something. Maybe the death of a friend or a relative of a, or a lover or some other traumatic event for which we blame ourselves. That's it. It's that simple. You just have to refuse to humor guilt. You have to refuse to deal with it. You have to refuse to allow it to control your actions or emotions. And this is the most difficult step. Some people, most people, frankly, never get this far. They never really make it past the leap. They never really make that leap of fanatical willpower that it takes to crush the past. Crush the past crush the past, focus on the now, focus on the future, and let the past go. Let me give a little analogy here that may be relevant. In property law, there's an old common law concept called the rule against perpetuities. And let me state it for you in its traditional form. You're not going to understand it, but I'll state it anyway because I'm going to explain it. It's The rule says, no interest in property is valid unless it vests not later than 21 years plus the period of gestation after some life in being or lives in which in being, <laughs> after some life or lives in being which exist at the time of the creation of the interest. See, even I get it wrong sometimes. Now you might say, what the hell does this mean? What the hell does that mean? And you have to ask, what does it have to do with guilt? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with guilt. This property law rule was developed hundreds of years ago in old England in order to restrict a person's power to control, control perpetually the ownership and possession of his or her property after death. It was also meant to ensure the transferability or defeasibility of property. It means, to simplify things, that people in the past and the events of the past cannot control or dictate the disposition and rules of real property forever in the real world now. That's why it's relevant. And how that relates to guilt is this. You can't let events of the past control the present or the future. At some point, we have to cut off the dead hand of the past. And that's why like this rule, and I like this analogy. Anyway, so getting back to guilt. We can't allow old things to control the future too much. At some point, we have to move on. We have to. We must, because if we don't, we will be throttled in our sleep and in our waking hours. Now, what's the third step in getting rid of guilt? The third step in getting rid of, rid of guilt and in keeping it out of your life is that you have to remove the reminders of it and remove the triggers of it. Dare I use that word triggers, which has so often been abused and misused. But we have to remove from our vision or from our hearing or sentient cognizance anything which might trigger guilt. And if you have to move to a different city or different town or different country or change jobs or whatever you need to do, you are going to need to do that. Because if the problem is serious enough, it will weigh on you. It will destroy you. 
I've seen people be eaten up and torn apart and their minds broken by guilt. Absolutely. Absolutely have seen it. Get away from people who make you feel guilty. Get away from the town that is the source of so many bad memories. Get away from the place, location, or source of the well-being. Get away. Get away. You have to remove items or possessions from your view that make you feel wistful, melancholy, or guilty. They don't do any good. You need to understand that this is not a choice. Either you do this, or the dead hand of the past will drag you down with it. Removing guilt from your life takes a long time. It is never really a finished process. You have to get rid of it and keep getting rid of it, or it has a tendency to come back, especially when you're the most vulnerable, especially when you're most vulnerable. And you don't have a choice. If it makes you feel any better, you can feel more comfortable in knowing that you don't have a choice. Either you eat it or it will eat you. And that will conclude our short discussion on guilt and eradicating it. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I would ask that you go to iTunes and write a short review so that other people can find these podcasts. Writing reviews is the way that other people can locate the podcasts and search search engines. This podcast was brought to you by Fortress of the Mind Publications. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.